Welcome to Municipal Affairs. Today, we will be navigating through the pressing issues confronting municipalities across the province of Alberta. Joining us in our roundtable discussion are esteemed guests who bring a wealth of experience and expertise to the table. We are joined by Alberta Municipalities President Mayor Tyler Gandam, Alberta Municipalities Director representing Towns East Mayor Trina Jones, and Alberta Municipalities Director representing cities up to 500,000 Councillor Dylan Bressy. Our agenda is packed with topics crucial to the understanding the landscape of Alberta municipalities in 2024. We will chat about the most recent Alberta Municipalities Spring Municipal Leaders Caucus. Following that, we'll be delving into the urgent need for increased provincial funding for local infrastructure, a matter that resonates deeply with communities across the province. Our attention then will shift to the implications of Bill 11 and the proposed creation of a provincial police agency to provide police-like services, a development stirring considerable debate among stakeholders in the province. And finally, we will explore the government of Alberta's intention to introduce political parties at the municipal level through changes to the Local Authorities Election Act, a potential game changer in the dynamics of local politics. So stay tuned as we navigate the crucial topics with our distinguished panel, offering insights and perspectives vital for understanding the challenges and opportunities facing Alberta's municipalities today. This is Municipal Affairs. Thank you everyone for being here. Greatly appreciated. I want to start by talking about the most recent event that Alberta municipalities held on March 14th and 15th in Edmonton, their spring uh, caucus meeting. Uh, I want to start with uh, Tyler, if possible. How did you think it went? I think it went really well. We had uh, about 350 delegates there. Uh, great to reconnect. Um, kind of Get your energy going again, uh, reconnecting with other mayors and councillors. Um, and I think it was a, a great, a great success. We broke out into, we broke it out a little bit differently this time where villages and towns and cities all got a chance to meet with one another as opposed to just constantly being in the big room with everybody. So they were able to go through and work through some of the issues that they're having, uh, best practices and just reconnecting and getting that networking done. So what was the big takeaway from the two-day event, uh, Mayor Jones? What was the big takeaway from uh, your perspective as a mayor of a uh, town? I think the biggest one, um, like Tyler mentioned, coming together in those networking sessions is we're all kind of in the same boat when it comes to infrastructure funding, uh, you know, trying to find money where it may not exist, uh, trying to get our projects ready to go. But we had some great conversations and I actually came away with a couple of possible solutions for some issues. And I heard some great things about, um, you know, a, a larger town talking to a smaller town and how they could work together even. Uh, and I think it's that spirit of collaboration that I always come out of these events with. And I think it's absolutely amazing. Tyler, did you, sorry, Mayor Gandam just spoke uh, a, a few seconds ago talking about how it was one of the largest gatherings that the organizations had in a spring meeting like this. Uh, Councillor, for yourself, is it good to meet up on a regular basis with your organization members to hear from them firsthand in that face-to-face -face, uh, setting rather than via Zoom or via email? Yeah, I know for, for me, I met so many brilliant colleagues across the province and it's great to be able to steal ideas from them. But also this is a job that's difficult at times and having that professional network is valuable. So is that personal network to help you support when the support you when the times are tough and give you people to celebrate with when the times are good. And so for me as somebody who's been in this job for about six years, these gatherings are invaluable. It's so important to meet people that understand what this job is like, but also are on my council doing it with me day in and day out. Now, one of the big uh, sessions that did happen during the two day uh, caucus retreat was around wildfire and drought. Water is a big topic that a lot of municipalities are addressing right now. One of your uh, colleagues, uh, the mayor of Okotoks, uh, Tanya Thorne, has been appointed to a committee to work with the province to deal with the ongoing water issues that we could be potentially be facing. What was the key takeaway for municipalities? 
realities, Tyler, around the issue of water management and water supply, because you heard from representatives from cabinet, the premier, the minister of environment, and even Minister McIver, the minister, minister of municipal affairs. I think just recognizing um, how dire things could be this this coming year, uh, recognizing I think Calgary is, is started if they haven't already implementing a, a water ban or a restriction, um, getting ready for what looks like a, a pretty dry summer. And we haven't had a lot of snowfall or precipitation so far. So it's going to make things a little bit more difficult. And I think early recognition, the province being on board with it and making sure that they're part of that solution too, to make sure that we don't get into a situation where we're having to ration water for uh, consumption, both for humans, obviously, and then uh, our cattle and, and our farm industry too, where it could suffer greatly. Uh, so nice to see that they're they're forward thinking in that uh, and appointing Tanya Thorne to that or Mayor Thorne to that uh, is absolutely brilliant. Her knowledge on water and what they've had to go through in Okotoks will definitely help uh, move things forward for everybody else across the province. These conferences uh, usually trans uh, transpire with a cabinet uh, sort of session where individual members can uh, address individual issues on a large scale uh, to individual cabinet members. Uh, how important is it for uh, an organization like Alberta Municipalities to have that sort of ongoing session with cabinet members where they come to your events and actually address the local concerns, not only in those breakaway sessions, but at that sort of quote unquote bear pit session, uh, Mayor Jones. Uh, it's absolutely critical. Uh, sometimes small towns don't always get the audience they want. Um, so uh, Councillor Bressy and I got to moderate those sessions and we got to hear a lot of the concerns that uh, may not get raised all the time, but our members are so good about asking questions that it may have a local focus, but it's going to affect a lot of other communities as well. And I think having an entire room be able to hear those answers and uh, really come together and possibly, you know, meet and, and bug some ministers later on, I think is a great asset. And I think we do really well at that. Councillor, for yourself, because you represent a more larger or, or urban centers, is it important to have these ongoing discussions, not only one-on-one uh, -on -one at your municipal level, but in this larger setting? So that way, the people of Medicine Hat might actually be hearing what the people of Grand Prairie are dealing with. And like uh, Mayor Jones talked about earlier, the best practices and take away some of what you're yes. doing Hat or Brooks or Okotoks or Chestermere. Yeah, I think it's important for us to be advocating together and hear the provincial the provincial government to hear that these aren't just voices coming from the Gal or Otasquin or Grand Prairie. These really are common issues we have across the province. I also think the useful thing about Bear Pit is often when we're meeting with ministers, there's one or two in the room and we're talking about just their portfolio. I think it's really helpful for us for multiple ministers to hear about our various issues, get an understanding there. I no, I was sitting next to a minister during um, a different minister during Minister McIver's address to it. And a few times she leaned over to me and she said, oh, I didn't know that. Or tell me more about this. And for a minister in a different portfolio, municipal issues still come up when they're around the cabinet table. So I don't want them just to understand what are municipal needs in their ministry, but cross ministry. And that's one of the reasons I think the bear pit is so valuable. Do you think you were heard? Because I think that's the key takeaway that a lot of municipal leaders would be taking away is while they can ask the questions at these conferences, at these caucus retreats, will there be implications of what has actually been asked or requested of this government uh, for all three of you? And anyone can jump in on this question. Do you feel like your members were heard at this uh, sort of the, this two day retreat from either the premier, the minister of municipal affairs, or even the cabinet colleagues who were taking part of that cabinet, uh, the bear pit session. I know for, for me personally, I appreciate not just bear pit, but also the premier, instead of giving long remarks, she gave short remarks. And then she personally took some questions too, and really appreciated that. And I think what my sense of this government is personally is that they do want to work with us. They do see us as on the same team of building great communities and um, they want, they, they want the same things we want. But often they don't understand the realities of what the municipal world is like. They don't understand the fiscal constraints we have. They don't understand 
the regulations that the province has created that we have to follow. And there's often a big education gap that exists there. And so I'm always looking forward to opportunities where we can talk to our colleagues in the province to really help them understand what are we working at on and what are the roadblocks, the barriers we're running into and the opportunities to do better together building our communities. I want to jump off on that for a second because you say building great communities. Now, Alberta municipalities, I, I'm not I'm not going to go with uh, this whole conversation without talking about infrastructure funding, infrastructure funding. It is a horse that you guys have been trying to ride into that uh, uh, legislature every single day since, well, yourself, Mayor Gandum, has been elected president. Uh, the last budget just was released in February, and now we are a month after. The announcements are sort of rolling out out of what the budget means for individual municipalities, but Alberta municipalities is still calling on this government to increase funding to LGFF, even though it was not in this upcoming budget. What does this mean for Alberta municipalities? Because the average person, I would assume, doesn't understand that you are in a deficit right now because they see the roads are being repaired and the potential infrastructure that needs improvement, they don't see it because it's underground. So what does this increase of funding mean for Alberta municipalities, the request, I should say? It's incredibly important. Uh, we've identified um, probably about a $30 billion infrastructure deficit across the province. Um, historically, when MSI first rolled out, the province was spending about $420 per Albertan on infrastructure and now we're down to 186 dollars per albertan so a significant cut over the last 12 or 13 years and that's not even taken into consideration the growth that we're seeing across the province unprecedented growth um they're looking at hitting over 5 million albertans here in the next couple of years and so that that puts a tremendous strain on our growing communities the fcm has done a study that for every new door that we bring into a municipality, it costs us about $107,000 um, to bring that into the network or into the system. So that's all of your water, wastewater, um, the road, sidewalks, everything else like that. And even if you're $5,000 a year in taxes on that house here over 20 years before you recoup that cost. And in that 20 years, you're going to have to be replacing a lot of that infrastructure as well. So it uh, growth is wonderful. It's fantastic to see, but it absolutely comes at a cost, and it's imperative that the province sees the importance of keeping up with not only inflation, but the, the pure deficit that we've got right now with that infrastructure uh, is going to continue to grow, and that gap is going to continue to get much bigger if we aren't seeing the, uh, the added funds for that. And so I think that as we went through, and Dylan can speak to it better, but when we went through and we looked at what our uh, LGFF funding or what MSI should be now with inflation, we should be at like two and a half billion dollars as a base funding. And we felt it was pretty fair to come out at $1.75 billion as a base funding for, for our communities to start looking after that desperately needed infrastructure, whether it's replacing it or building new. So before I get Councillor to respond to that, I, I, can you give me a tangible item in each one of your communities that you have had to put off because of this funding deficit that you are so, you're adamant that the province needs to come to the table and address, because we talk about numbers, $1.75 billion is a large number, but what does that mean for your individual communities? Is there projects that have been put on hold because the funding isn't there? Who wants to take the councillor, uh, Mayor Jones, would you like to address that one first? I, I know uh, Dylan and Tyler are tired of hearing me talk about my arena, but it's it, it's the biggest infrastructure infrastructure project we've got going. And yes, we've had delays. Um, we were hoping to, you know, have this done a while ago, but because we had to put money into a sewer system, uh, this had to be pushed off. Um, that sewer system had to be pushed off because we had water line issues. We, um, you know... Then we had a road fall apart. You know, sometimes these things snowball, and you need when you when you have to put off major projects that may not be in the public eye. They're not the big sexy projects, um, but they're critical for our people, uh, and they're being pushed off. It adds to that deficit over and over and over again, and leads to a us asking for more funding. B us having to push off 
projects or C, take out massive loans that really we really shouldn't have to do. Councillor, what about yourself up in Grand Prairie? Is there projects that you've been putting off because the funding just isn't there? Yeah, and it's always awkward being the one councillor with two mayors because I can't speak for my council unlike them. Uh, but speaking very personally, a uh, piece of infrastructure I think about a lot is our local roads. So not our big collectors that you see thousands of vehicles on, but just the road that's just in front of people's houses. And we got some that are 30, 40, 50 years old, and they're in terrible shape. And I just don't see how we're ever going to catch up on those given current funding realities. I when we've seen our infrastructure funding from the province be cut in half um, over the last seven years that I've been on council, despite inflation making everything more expensive, I personally don't see how we're ever going to catch up on those local roads without jacking up property taxes so far that our residents can't afford it and businesses won't do business in the city anymore. And that's probably the, the best example of that. Uh, we drive on our roads, we walk the sidewalks, we want some trails and connectors done that way too. And and residents see that they complain about the potholes, they complain about the roads being in such poor disrepair, and all of a sudden um, we're either having to put those projects off or delay doing an overlay or a replacement on that, um, or taxes go up, and it, and we've only really got one way to to create more revenue, and so raising property taxes isn't isn't great. Nobody likes that. Uh, one of the frustrating things I think for me is that. We get programs like grants in place of taxes. So the, the province owns properties in each of our communities, and that's been cut in half over the last few years. And one of those things is that our residents probably don't recognize or see that. Um, but then we're we're faced with having to raise taxes or lower our, our levels of service or delay some of the project that we were talking about earlier on. Uh, Trina's arena is a great example of that, which probably would have been done right now had there been adequate funding but then has had to fight tooth and nail to, to get to that point. And then things get delayed because emergencies come up and emergencies cost you that much more money. So if you're not looking after the infrastructure um, and replacing it as opposed to doing it as an emergency, then you're spending that much more. And then if we're borrowing money, the province has taken away the, the low cost of borrowing that we were able to use a, a few years ago, which again, either delays projects or it's costing a municipality more money to get things done when we're borrowing at a higher rate. I'm going to play a little bit of devil's advocate with the three of you for a second, if you don't mind, because I've been around the block. Okay. I've come out and said, we've given you LGFF. It is now predictable. You now know what you're going to get two years out. So you know that you can schedule your budget for next year. But you're saying that's not enough. You're saying you need to increase that funding. And I, I, you kind of talked about property taxes being increased. Where do you hope this money comes from? Because at the end of the day, there's only one taxpayer. We all know that. Where is this money going to come from? Are you looking at the province to say you have to dip into your reserves? You're talking about putting away money for rainy days. Well, it's rainy days now. Who wants to take that one? No, I think you're absolutely right. And I think it comes down to, it just comes down to, the, to their budgeting and our budgeting as well. And we have to make things a priority. Uh, growing the province was a priority for the province. Um, so that's that's got to come at a cost, and you can't put that on the backs of the municipality to to absorb that cost while they're building and developing new sections that needs either to be replaced or repaired. Um, so whether it's finding efficiencies in health, um, not cutting taxes for the everyday Albertan when we have, I, I get the Alberta advantage and, and you know, you wanna make it attractive to come here, but it still can't come at the cost of municipalities because that's the that's the very end of it all. If we're not getting support from the federal government or the provincial government, then it comes down to the municipality who has to manage that budget. And here we are, we're either raising taxes or we're lowering our level of service or delaying projects. It's, it's really that simple. So. For sure, there there needs to be a better plan. And I think one of the things that we're asking for from the province is to be a part of that planning process. So when it comes to growth, when it comes to healthcare, when it comes to education, and when it comes to infrastructure, these are all things happening in our community. So why don't we have that conversation and let you know kind of where we're struggling and maybe that has a change with how, how the province is um, allocating that funding. Mayor Jones, are you hearing from your residents about this issue? Because 
when I speak to the uh, people on the street, I, I and I say people on the street, my friends, my family members, my neighbors, I don't hear them talking about infrastructure. Is is this a common theme across Alberta, or are there pockets that I'm just not talking to the right people and they're not addressing these infrastructure deficits that we're seeing? Were you, as the, the elected leaders, the closest to the people who represent them, who literally work and play and uh, go to the arena, your community? members saying we need to fix these infrastructure deficits they may not be using the word infrastructure deficit it you know specifically but they do understand that something has to be done um they understand that we can't afford to do this all on our own they understand that they're our only source of income um they understand that we have to prioritize certain things over other things and I think they're just as frustrated as I am when when I can't build what I need to build because of all the things that Tyler mentioned earlier, including the low cost loans, it's they see it in their everyday lives, which means we hear about it in our everyday lives. So maybe they're not using those words specifically, but they do understand the issue and they do understand that something needs to be done to solve it. Is it more, and I, I'm going to stay with the Mayor Jones here for a second, because I've got to, because you both represent cities, Mayor Gandam and Councilor Bressy, but is the lack of infrastructure funding effect, negatively affecting more smaller towns, rural communities than it is, say, the larger cities? Because we often hear, oh, Edmonton is getting money, Calgary is getting money, but the smaller rural communities, the and I say rural as in urban rural communities, are they getting the same treatment, would you say, that uh, the larger, your larger sister colleagues are getting? I think shortages are, they may not be on the same scale across the province. Um but when it comes to roads, potholes, sewers, water treatment, all of that kind of stuff, maybe I don't have that $2 billion price tag or whatever, like Edmonton or Calgary does. But that $2 million price tag is still very relevant to my community. It may not be the same scale, but they are the same issues. And my city colleagues can jump in on that, you know, because uh, I know they're in the same boat as I am. Well, and often it's as mid-sized cities, often we feel like we're the ones that are that are left out. And I think every type of municipality probably has times where they feel like we're being forgotten. But when it comes to infrastructure funding, there's often talks about Calgary, Edmonton, rural. Um, I'm I know Trina considers herself rural. I certainly don't consider myself self rural, but you look at uh you look at the local government fiscal framework funding formula and a whole bunch of it is eaten up by a base amount that goes to every single municipality, which means that mid-sized cities get a lot lower of that pot when it's at its current amount than if it's increased. And it's a formula that works well for mid-sized cities and if it's appropriately funded. Mid-sized cities are the ones that disproportionately suffer when that pot is underfunded. Then you also look at Water for Life and STIP grants, basic infrastructure grants that are available to most municipalities but not to cities or not cities over 10,000. And so often as a city person, sometimes it feels frustrating being a city person um, that, that we've got these programs for towns, we've got these one-offs for the large cities. I think there's growing talk in the mid-sized cities about, all right, but what about us? We've got our own unique needs too. Of course, I know that our summer villages, our villager towns, they feel that, that way at times too. And it definitely is this really hard thing of how do you meet the needs of both Calgary and Edmonton and how do you meet the needs of acne? It's it, it definitely is a complicated thing. Before we turn to the next subject, I have one last question for Mayor Gandam on this. As president, I, I recently had the pleasure to sit down with the mayor of the town of Gibbons on our sister show, Cross Border Interviews, and we talked about uh, the issues that were going on. And he says, and it's going to be airing later on this week as of this airing, uh, he talked about that if there's no infrastructure uh, sort of in uh, increase smaller rural or smaller communities i'm not going to say rural anymore because i i, I realize that, that you're not rural you are urban centers uh smaller urban communities may start seeing decreases in to be able to survive do you agree with that yeah absolutely and it's uh, 
Dylan spoke to it in the uh, the mid for the mid cities, but the the summer villages, the villages, and the towns are all very relevant with that too. And so, if they're not being supported um, and they're not seeing that kind of growth as well, it makes it harder for them to be viable. And we're looking at at different ways to create um, an easier way for those smaller centers to be more viable. But there's 330-ish municipalities across the province, uh, whether you consider them rural or urban, however you want to classify them. But everybody's got a need. Everybody's got, like, they're all as important to themselves as, as the next one. And I think it's really important that we start looking at it that way. And sometimes we might have to look at a way to maybe be a little bit more efficient. Um, you look at Black Diamond, Turner Valley, instances like that, I think, um, might need to start being in the conversation sooner than later so that we aren't missing or losing um, municipalities. We're not having municipalities that are no longer viable when they had an opportunity uh, earlier maybe to uh, to start working with others to to make sure that they can continue operating. And that's that's a really tough thing to, to have a conversation about. You, you might have that feeling of losing your autonomy, your identity, and I think that quite the opposite can happen. I think you can grow and flourish uh, in that kind of environment, but getting over that little bit of a hump where you think you might be losing your autonomy um, makes it really difficult. But in the long term, what's best for my community, I think it needs to have at least some consideration. Yeah, and before we hop on to the next topic, get away from infrastructure funding, I got to go back to a question you asked a little bit ago, and I didn't get in on, and that's oh. talking about the what's the what's the one taxpayer? Where's the money going to come from? And sometimes I'd love to spend an hour just talking about how property taxation is a horrible way to tax people and all the opportunities to fix it. I won't get down that nerdy rant right now, but what I will point out is right now in Alberta we've got a housing shortage, and what that means is people are showing up. And if there's no new home for them, they're filling up the rooms in existing houses. Well, when somebody moves to the province and they move into the second bedroom of that apartment or they fill up that or they fill up that crew house, all of a sudden they're paying income tax to the province. They're paying all these other types of provincial taxes, but they haven't built a new house. So our funding as a municipality doesn't go up. So if we want to keep up with the growth we're seeing here in Alberta, then municipalities need to be able to share with the province the increased revenue it's seeing so that we can build the infrastructure for these people so that two years into working here, they don't say, hey, I'm stuck in the second room of this apartment. I got to go back home where I can actually get a get a house myself, but we've actually built the infrastructure they need. And I think that's an important consideration is just if we're not going to do it through provincial grant funding, the money has to come from somewhere. That really does mean property taxes. And if you're going to nerd out, I'm going to nerd out for a little bit too, because we have to remember that property taxes don't all stay in the municipalities. They do go to the province as well. There's a portion of property taxes that are dedicated to, to the municipal, uh, go to the province, and then you get reimbursed some of that funding, not all of it, but some of it. Um, I, since we're in this line of question, I've, I've got to ask, because we did see a little bit of an increase to the education property tax uh, that you guys will be sending out tax tax notices later on this month if you haven't already sent them out uh are you are you having discussions around uh, communicating to the residents that not all of this property tax increase if you have any is on the backs of is because of the municipality it's also because of the province as well uh dylan since we, we you nerded it out first let's go with you on this question yeah, absolutely. We're seeing, if I remember the number right, we're, it's just under 10% is what the provincial property tax revenue is increasing by this year. I know municipalities, because we're seeing increased costs and decreased provincial funding, we worked really hard to keep increases to a minimum. Most I'm seeing, they're more in the 5% range. So it, it does hurt to see the provincial property tax going up by closer to 10, 10%. It really does have an impact on the affordability of owning and operating properties in our communities. Mayor Gandam or Mayor Jones, do you have anything to add before we move on to Bill 11 and the introduction of that? So, yeah, just kind of jumping off what Dylan said. Um, we only have so much room we can tax our people on. Um, so, for example, we have a 10% tax rate in Miguel. However, trying to educate people that 3% of that goes back to the province. Another 1.5% of that goes to our housing foundation. Um trying to there are educational options 
However, when we have to then add in police funding, we have to add in loan own repayments. We have to, you know, trying to educate our people on where every single one of their dollars goes is it's been important in the past, but get it moving forward into the next five years. I think it's going to be extra critical. And I think we need to find new avenues or uh, be louder about how we do that. Yeah. Having good communication with our residents about why there's an increase, where that increase is going to, whether it's within the municipality or through that school tax requisition. Um, but again, the the homeowner, the business owner is going to look at the bottom line. This is what my taxes are. And they've gone up either considerably or what am I getting for my money? And we have to make sure that they understand that a big part of that is 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 going back to the province. And for us last year, after the um, RCMP contracts were had been finalized, we had a 24% increase to our RCMP contract and had a $768,000 increase to what we were paying for the RCMP. And, and I'm not criticizing that at all, but when 5% of a tax increase comes just strictly from something that is completely out of our control, it's so important that we get that communication out there, but it also becomes really apparent that again, people aren't worried about where it's going or why it's going. They just see that number at the bottom of the, the bill and wonder why their taxes have gone up so much. Let's talk about Bill 11 then for a few minutes, if you don't mind, uh, because why not? We this is the, the you guys are great at segueing into the next topic, and we're going to talk about Bill 11. Uh, Alberta Public Safety and Emergency Services Minister Mike Ellis, who's also the Deputy Premier, introduced Bill 11, which is titled the Public Safety Statutes Amendment Act. Earlier this month, actually a day before your your meeting in Edmonton with your Alberta municipal leaders, uh, Mayor Gandam, as president, uh, what was your initial reaction? Because we are hearing conflicting reactions from uh, different organizations out there. But from Alberta's municipality standpoint, what was your initial reaction? My initial reaction was I wasn't sure what what was being proposed. To me, it wasn't clear about what the new agency was going to be. Uh, I actually had the opportunity to talk with Minister Ellis at our MLC, our Municipal Leaders Caucus last week, and just get some clar clarity and some clarification on what that looks like. And so sheriffs, as they were, were peace officers. And so they're making them police officers, extra duties. Um, and when they have somebody who's in the area of a crime, regardless of whether it's the RCMP or the sheriff, they're able to respond to that call as police officers and not just peace officers. So I think that was really important that we got clarification on that. Um, and again, not that it's going to be a provincial police service. It was just bringing more, more resources, I think, to some of the communities that um, might not have that police presence. And I'd made a comment last week about... Um, where some of that funding could go or might be able to go. And I talked about some of the social workers that could either accompany a police officer or the social workers uh, attending these calls as opposed to um, the police. Dealing with mental health isn't necessarily a police matter. And I think there was, my miscommunication was that I didn't think that we didn't need more police, which I, I think we absolutely do. And I don't wanna take away from some of the communities that don't have a, a constant police presence at all. But I think if we can take away from some of the calls that the police are responding to that they're not equipped to, gives them more of an opportunity to respond to the calls that they need to be responding to. And especially in those smaller communities that might not have a detachment or that are further away from a detachment and don't get the response times that they they should or could be getting. Uh, I just want to make sure that our resources are, are well looked after and up responding to these calls appropriately. When social social workers need to be there, not police, uh, frees up our pleasing resources to attend other calls. Not that we have someone on this uh, in this uh, roundtable discussion who comes from a smaller community who may not have a RCMT detachment, if I'm not mistaken. Correct me if I'm wrong here, Mayor Jones. But for you as a smaller uh, mayor, town mayor, what does this bill mean for you? Because I remember from our conversation last year where we had you on the show, you talked about some of the needs that your community was facing and a higher police presence was one of those discussions topics that we did talk about so yeah you're correct um our closest detachment is Morinville 
uh, so they we, they operate out of there. Um, I, I'm not a hundred percent sure how Bill Eleven will affect us. Like speaking just of legal, uh, we don't see sheriffs very often through town. Um, usually we see them on Highway Two, Eight Hundred Three, Twenty Eight. Um, so I'm not a hundred percent sure of the impacts, but basically my residents want to see an officer respond. Um, and yes, if it's a mental health issue, they want that mental health support for their people, for whoever's suffering from that. If it's a addiction issue, they want that person to have help. And they do understand that our police can only do so much. So yes, I want to see more boots. Yes, I would love to see a bigger response uh, in my community, but I do so want to see our, our our folks getting that direct support that they need and that doesn't always involve an officer counselor i was just i just recently had the pleasure of sitting down with the cold uh, mayor of cold lake craig copland and we talked about this issue and as the director of uh cities uh, uh, under five hundred thousand, i've got to ask is this a good step for more municipalities of larger uh larger municipalities who may be needing that extra hand hand a little bit with sheriffs coming into the communities and helping the rcmp or like in Grand Prairie, a city police. And honestly, I honestly I don't know what this what's going to go because we just don't have the information yet. I think if the sheriffs are going to be asked to do more than they're doing now, then it totally makes sense to me that we want to make sure they've got the right training, that they've got the right civilian oversight, and that they've got the proper pay to match up with the jobs they're doing. Is that the best solution or not? I honestly don't know. But what I do know is that the province, through the Municipal Government Act, has said that local councils, are our duty is to create safe and viable local communities. If we're going to be making significant changes to how we're doing, doing policing across the province, then municipalities better be front and center at that table. Because we're the people that are sleeping every night in our community, running to people at the grocery the grocery store, often the first ones to see somebody if their bike got stolen or something even worse, worse happened. And so is it good or bad? I don't know. I am concerned that so far some changes that are being made to legislation and we haven't been at the table. Alberta municipalities has not been uh, advocating for El an Alberta police force. Uh, I Again, I've been listening to the rhetoric out there. I've been following social media. I, I I hear what people are saying. This government says they do not want a provincial police force. May uh, Deputy Premier Mike Ellis says there is no intention. But we're going to be talking about a subject a little bit later about not wanting something and then doing the exact opposite. Do you have concerns that this could open up? Uh, it could be a way that they're just doing it backhandedly and opening up a potential Alberta police force. Uh, I, I really hope not. My, my hope is that they recognize the need for more community safety, increasing the ability of our sheriffs, um, having a bigger mandate, being paid as police officers and responding to call as police officers is exactly what I think um, many of our communities are looking for, especially when they made changes to the police funding model. And some of our smaller communities that weren't paying for policing before have been asking for more police. Uh, and just even having that presence, like Trina had said, they're, they don't have a detachment in Legal, but they would like to see an officer in the town. Um, and that's that just there's a sense of of safety for sure. Um, so no, I don't, and I'm hoping that if there is that, um, if the talks open up again about the provincial police service, that we're brought to the table and have having that conversation, and it's put up put to a referendum so that Albertans can can make that make that call if they want to with with good information, and I think that's really important didn't support was what was being proposed for a provincial police service and so we aren't opposed to one it's just that what they were proposing at the time didn't fit the needs of our members and our members spoke up very well and very clearly that that wasn't something that they supported either but that doesn't mean that we're not willing to have that conversation it's just important that we're a part of that conversation 
during your fall convention, Alberta municipalities members voted to advocate to the provincial government to not introduce partisan politics into the municipal conducted a survey. And after a Freedom of Information Act by a Edmonton newspaper, it was found that over, I think, close to 70 percent of respondents said they do not want this. But it is confirmed as of this month that the government will be going ahead with it from what we hear from Danielle Smith, Premier Danielle Smith and Minister Rick McIver, that the introduction of partisan politics will be happening this spring session or potentially fall. Um, this has got to be a blow to Alberta municipalities and your members, because I can imagine this is the last thing you would want to be talking about in 2024 when you are dealing with so many other pressing issues around infrastructure deficits, around crime, around health. Uh, Mayor Gandum, I've got to ask, are you shaking your head right now? Yeah, I absolutely have. And we've had the opportunity to speak with um, with the province about this. We've shared that our members are well over 90 percent not in favor of this. Uh, we conducted a survey, an independent survey, 70% of Albertans weren't in favor of it. The province's polls survey said the same thing, about 70% weren't in favor of it. And uh, a really good example of this was a conversation I had last week with a councillor from Calgary. And we were talking about um, homeless and vulnerable populations, the, the need for social supports, um, and where, where a person might align on a, a political spectrum for for an everyday life and for me as a mayor are two almost different things I, I would say that naturally or normally I would be right of center and as a mayor I'm probably left of center because I'm dealing with a lot more of the social needs in my community that I would be if I wasn't the mayor and so we had a fairly long conversation about this and why why I didn't support political parties at the municipal level I feel that it's going to cause some divisiveness. I think that when you're voting in favor or opposed to something, it should be in the best interest of your community and not what what or where your party is aligning on it. Um, and then he had a question about what I felt or how I felt about safe consumption sites. And I said, I don't like I don't want to get into another conversation. And he was like, that's the problem with you lefties, blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, well, <laughs> settle down. First of all, no. Second of all, this is a great example of why political parties at the municipal level don't make any sense. Why can I not have an opinion on something that has nothing to do where I align with on a political spectrum and more to do with what's what's in the need of my community? And then it goes back to the governance and the budgeting at the municipal level is completely different than the provincial and federal, where whether or not we're looking at improving a park or um, more money to roads and sidewalks or where we're going to allocate funds for um, infrastructure of water and wastewater has zero to do with where I align politically and everything to do with what's in the best interest of my community. And I just don't see an advantage to having a political party um, in the municipal level. And you can you can run on whatever platform you want. Uh, Minister McIver said right now, like there are there are absolutely blocks and slates that are running. Um, there are obviously members of council who align with provincial and federal political parties, which is fine, but I don't see a need for it to be on a ballot to uh, to distinguish between who's who and who aligns with what political party. It seems like, and this is just from my uh, observation, that this is aimed more at Edmonton and Calgary and their, uh, from what Premier Smith is saying, that you, you get elected on something, you govern on something you're not elected on. But it sounds like this is not just going to be an Edmonton and Calgary uh, move. It's going to be a blanket cross Alberta move where partisan politics will be introduced at every single municipality, whether it be the smallest community, summer village, to the largest municipality of Edmonton or Calgary. Councillor, uh, for you up in uh, Grand Prairie, uh, had you heard from anyone? And I say this with respect because I don't know where they're getting this information. I do not understand me or who's leading this conversation. But there is only a few people on social media that has been advocating for uh, political parties. Have you heard from anyone in Grand Prairie or in your conversations with municipal leaders that this is something that they would want to even entertain? I've never heard from anybody outside of anonymous social media posts. 
And I'm sure that the I'm sure that there's real people behind that. I'm sure there's real people that exist, but I've never had somebody come up to me and advocate for me. And what I'm really concerned about, and again, this goes back to the education piece with our provincial colleagues. Politics at the local level just is very different. It's even though it's still politics, it's less political. Outside of Calgary, Edmonton, most of us aren't paid full time. I'm a part time counselor in many of our towns and villages. They're basically volunteer counselors. We're not people that have a career in politics. We're usually community volunteers that have just taken kind of the next step up of community organization. We don't have the same appetite to go into a back room and figure out what's our political strategy to get this through against the other people. And that's just not how municipal leaders tend to look at things. And I don't think we've got thousands of people with that, those partisan bones in their body that would be needed to fill partisan councils across Alberta. So what I'm really worried about this is it's already really hard to get people to agree to put their hand up and run for council. I think if we're pushing through this party, there's just going to be so many more Albertans that check out and go, that job already was something that I had worries about. Now I'm 100% out because I don't want to play politics. I just want to fix the roads, make sure that the poop goes where the poop needs to go, and have an acceptable level of recreation services in my community. Mayor Jones, as someone who who represents a small town, who you and I had the pleasure of walking around Legal just recently over the last few weeks, um, you you know everyone in that community and you are elected by knowing everyone in that community because they wouldn't put their trust in you. Do you think by introducing partisan politics into those smaller communities like Legal, you would lose that connection that you would have from being able to walk down the street and not being that party official and then just being the mayor of the community or heck, just Trina from time to time? There's five of us on council. Um, we don't have big political agendas. We don't have massive fundraising needs. We don't, I, I, to, to, you know, be a little bit blunt and a little bit flippant about it, but potholes are not partisan. And I fail to see how any kind of left, right, center, however it is, what that has to do with you, with how your community runs, especially a small community. Um, and yeah, sorry, I get a little bit fired up about this issue, but yes, I got voted in as Trina, as a community volunteer, as somebody who wants to do right by my community. And I fail to see how any kind of party affiliation or throwing that on a ballot is going to change that. Sorry, I was just going to say, say an example of something going on in Grand Prairie recently is our council spent for spent years uh, moving towards possibly adopting this thing called a stormwater utility. And again, I won't nerd out on on why that is, but it's something we put a lot of work into. And just a couple of weeks ago, after talking to our community and realizing that residents didn't understand it and there were some potential flaws to the direction we were moving and our community just wasn't re ready for it, council unanimously agreed to back away from this big change we've been pushing. If we existed in a party system where there'd been six of us pushing this change and three against it all along, I just don't know if we ever get to that point of being able to listen to our community, listen to each other and say, no, 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 we need to change direction. I just don't think you have that same kind of adaptable conversation and approach to things when your politics are about this color versus this color instead of just nine individuals saying, how are we going to figure out what's best for our community on an issue by issue basis? Is there concern around the table? And this is a question for all three of you. Is there a concern around the table that if the introduction, if they actually do go ahead with this, which by it sounds like they will, that the decision making decision making process that you guys have relied on over the last term, two terms, however long you've been in office, could be taken away from you and moved to a central location, whether it be Edmonton or Calgary, and then the dictations of what a party leader wants rather than what the individual local representative wants is going to change dramatically. And you're going to see someone in Ottawa pulling the strings or sorry, I shouldn't say Ottawa because we're talking about a provincial for someone in Edmonton pulling the strings on to happen in Wetasco and Grand Prairie or Legal. Is there major concern that the decision making at the local level is going to be centralized at potentially the legislative assembly? Tyler? 
I, I haven't given it that much thought in terms of where the decisions are coming from. I think your, your alliance with one of the comments made was is that it's not going to have a direct tie to a provincial party. So there's not going to be the UCP party of Wetaskiwin or the NDP party of Wetaskiwin. But I mean, it's not going to take um, a whole lot of research to find out who the the blue or orange person is on a ballot and where they align on on that, right? And who they're aligning with provincially. And I just don't see any benefit to having any kind of alliance to to party politics at the municipal level. It's nothing I'm afraid of. I I I just don't see the advantage. I don't see them changing how um what our voter turnout is. I don't see it changing, like Trina had said, the big need for fundraising for candidates. I think you're actually going to turn people away from it as opposed to attract people to it. I also think the other thing I'm worried about is what it does to democratic discourse at the municipal level. Already, every election, we're trying really hard um, to, to talk to people not about schools and the carbon tax and these things that we have absolutely no power of. Every four years, we have the opportunity to go to our residents and actually have a conversation about the truly local municipal issues. What's your expectations on snow removal? But what's your what are, what are your family's needs in terms of recreation? How can we um how can we better help people be welcome in our community community? And we're gonna lose all of that if all of a sudden where our elections get tied into federal and provincial elections, whether officially or not, if we've got parties, they're gonna be tied into what's going on federally and provincially. And all of a sudden, our municipal elections truly are likely to become just referendums on what the province is doing. And I don't think that helps our community figure out how to better take care of our residents at the municipal level. Minister McIver would say, and he has said, that you're not required to run on a political part in a political party if the introduction of political parties does happen. What do you say to that? Right. You're absolutely yeah, I you're right. We you're not required to. But then does that put you at a disadvantage? because you're not aligning with a block or a slate or a, a party at that local level, because there is that, there already is a misunderstanding, I think of, of political parties and, and where they align or what their policies are. It would be really interesting to see somebody read policies um, at the provincial level without knowing whose policy it was and where somebody would align um, with which party. And whether or not it's just you are historically an NDP supporter or a UCP supporter, or you actually um, follow and and uh, really resonate that their policies really resonate with you, and so it would be interesting to know where somebody would align that way as opposed to just who you've historically voted for. Um, I've been asked in the past, you know, where do you fall on the political spectrum, and when it comes to municipal issues, it, it, it's why does it matter? Um, I'm going to be doing my best to keep taxes low. I'm going to do my best to make sure that social services are in place. Um, I'm going to do my best to make sure, you know, everything is in balance. Does that make me left? Does it make me right? No, that makes me kind of everything across the spectrum because I'm going to do the what's best for my community. And I think being able to run as an independent is critical to being able to make those decisions and having even the perception that I'm aligning with a political party from another level of government is going to be detrimental to that. I want to add one last thing before we wrap up here, because the partisan politics is not the only thing that is going to be uh, potentially changing with the uh, changes to the local authorities elections act. Now, Premier Smith has come out uh, and talked about the recall legislation that has been put through uh, under Premier Jason Kenney and that she thinks that it should be a lower standard compared to what it is currently. Um, I'm going to rip the Band-Aid off here for a second, but Mayor Gandum, President Gandum, you are currently going through a recall vote yourself. Um when the premier addresses this issue and says that the standard for recalling a politician like yourself, what do you say? I, why do we have elections then? So I can I can completely understand um, 
recall legislation for a member of council doing something illegal or totally egregious, having municipal affairs, being able to step in and say, you know what, this, this doesn't, this doesn't meet your code of conduct. Or if somebody does get sanctioned or potentially could be sanctioned and, but your buddies with everybody on your council. So of course you're not going to vote in favor of, of you being sanctioned or being held accountable for something. Um, absolutely. There should be uh, another way that the community can hold you accountable, but right now it's being weaponized. I support a homeless shelter recall petition. There's a counselor in uh, Red Deer County that I spoke with last night. He was in favor of the budget, threatened with recall legislation. There's a counselor, or sorry, the mayor of Mayor Thorpe is being threatened with recall legislation because of a um, trade mission. Like it, it's being thrown around. The, the mayor of um, Medicine Hat, same thing. Utility costs um, through the municipality are too high, recall legislation. Um, Jody Gondak, Mayor Gondak out of Calgary, you know, might not align totally with whoever in their community, recall legislation. Show me where that's not being weaponized and I'm absolutely in favor of it. And I would be in favor of the uh, the threshold being lower on the number of um, signatures you needed if there was a way to protect members of council where it's not being weaponized. And it's easy for me to say that I'm not in favor of it right now because I've got 23 days left of, of my recall petition, um, but it's absolutely being weaponized. And I don't think that there is anything for members of council to protect themselves um, doing their job that they were elected to do, duly elected by the residents. And now you don't like me or I, I support something that you don't support, whether I ran on it or not, you're, you have the ability to spend $500 and drag my name through the mud for 60 days, go door to door telling everybody how horrible I am and puts me at a disadvantage if I run again in 25 and allows you to build a, a list of names and email addresses or addresses for the next election because there's no, there's no protection of that information. If the person doesn't get uh, the required signatures. They're not required to turn that information in. Not that it would matter because you could photocopy it anyways, but there's no protection of that information and finding out who your supporters are through legislation at the provincial level um, where it's just being, I, I feel is very unfair to members of council for those reasons alone of why somebody's being threatened with recall. Councillor, I'm going to throw it over to you for a second. I, you just off your MLC meeting in Edmonton, um, Mayor Gandam just talked about the the two, the mayor from Mayor of Red Deer County talking about this uh, recall legislation of being weaponized. Um, does it give you pause and second guess what decisions you're making around that council when it could be potentially weaponized and things might slow down and the it, the issues that municipalities are going to be dealing with are not going to be addressed because you're afraid to, and I don't want to say afraid, but I'm going to have to in this sense, afraid to move something or even work on something because someone may just not like you that day and say, I'm going to use it because I just don't like Councillor Bressy today. Not that I don't. I like you, man. You're a great guy. I'm just saying that hypothetically someone in your municipality might think that. Yeah. And I guess what uh, what I'm afraid with it is in terms of I get threatened with recall somewhat regularly now. I, I doubt there's many elected officials that it's not a threat that comes up all the time. And for me, realistically, is under the current barriers, is a recall of me possible? No, not unless I do something really egregious, just because a few people disagree with me. I'm, I know I'm not going to get recalled. But what I'm worried about is this is my second term on council. And last term, it felt like for residents that disagreed with me, it felt like there was a lot more understanding of, yeah, but we're stuck with you for the next four years. And so we'll still meet with you. We'll still hammer out issues. We'll make sure that you understand our perspective. We'll try to understand yours. And we'll put this whole campaigning, we'll put the whole political stuff on hold for the next three, three and a half years. So we get to the next silly season and we'll just work on our community. And what I'm worried about is now if we introduce recalls that start coming at the middle of every single council term, that means instead of getting three to three and a half years without silly season, you really get six months at the beginning of your term and 
maybe six months in the first half of the last part of your term. And it really doesn't encourage residents to work with counselors and try to influence counselors that they disagree with. Instead, it um, really encourages them to to go to go to Mach 10 on on their on their disagreement. And especially in communities like mine, where that threshold's so big, they're never going to successfully recall me probably. I don't think it's actually helping them advocate for change on council. And so it's a tool that might be a valuable tool when you've got those really egregious behaviors by some counselors. But I don't think we're we're um, bettered by making this job even more political than it already is. Mayor Jones, as someone who represents a smaller town, and I say smaller town in population size, um, the recall threshold for smaller communities is quite substantially low. And you know everyone in your community, not that the, the councillor and Mayor Gandam don't know everyone compared to them. Uh, so for recall legislation, lowering that threshold where there might be a portion of the population of Legal who say, Trina, you're doing a bad job. We don't want you to be here anymore. So we're going to potentially weaponize this uh, program to oust you. Does it give you second thought about potentially what you're putting forward at council and what your council members are doing? Because you don't want to have to face the, uh, and I don't want to say jury, but they kind of are the jury in this situation because as long as they get enough signatures, you could be out. Personally, I'm not worried about it. And I, I guess I'm one of the lucky ones who hasn't been threatened with it yet. Um, but, um, I, I, it doesn't really give me pause, um, because the community needs what the community needs and whether somebody agrees with it or not, I I'm just in my community. I'm not that concerned about it. Um, our council is very engaged. Um, and we all, all five of us know everybody in this community. You know, if one of us doesn't know them, the other, somebody else does. So in, in our community specifically, it's not that. It's not really a concern. What I do worry about is coming up in 2025. Um, should I not run, I'm going to start recruiting people to, to run in my space. So, but I'm already hearing concerns. Well, what's the point? They're just going to kick me out in 18 months. So I worry about that, that good governors will not run and will end up with that with more polarization and more anger and more division on councils. And and quite frankly, nothing's ever going to get accomplished. So that's a good last question I want to ask to uh, President Gandum, because we talked about political parties. Now we've talked about recall legislation. Now, if you put two hand in hand those two things, you've got a recipe for a potential disastrous four years after 2025, 2025 to 2029 with political parties and a lower threshold for recall legislation municipalities aren't going to be able to get anything done in my, like that's from an outsider's perspective, who's not an elected official. Do you have concerns that the, the path that this government is going provincially could spell disasters for the great work that municipalities are doing and the great governance that you guys try to adhere to. And I say try to, because there's always places where you can always improve, but is there, is, does it concern you that the future of partisan or even partisan or, I'm not, not sure if that's an, even a word, but then it was in this term. Yeah, absolutely. I think, like Trina said, trying to get good people to run again. I can't tell you how many times I've heard, why can't why can't we get good people to run for for mayor or council? Well, look at the way you've been treating them. And especially over the last three or four years, it's gotten progressively worse. And I get that COVID was really hard on everybody and they I think a lot of people used up all of their energy just to get through that the pandemic. And now we're left with um, people who are just at their wits end with with a lot of things. And understandably so, I, I absolutely get it. But you're making it really difficult. You're creating a, a poor environment, I think, for somebody, for these community builders, for the people who love their towns and cities to want to get involved at the municipal level um, as a mayor or a councillor based on, first of all, the abuse they take, um, the introduction of party politics, the ability to recall somebody because they voted in favor of a budget uh, 18 months after they were elected. I think that just, it it will create an environment that somebody who values themselves probably isn't going to get involved. 
And then we're going to go through an election in 25 where you're going to get, you know, maybe hopefully some really good candidates who are still running. But if it continues to go as poorly as it has been in terms of the abuse, 29 is going to be a, a tough year to, to recruit good people to want to run for council. And we have a number of the smaller communities that have to beg beg people to run just so that they're acclaimed, like there isn't even an election. So what's that going to look like after another four years of, of the kind of abuse that elected officials are taking? And it's not just municipal. And I know that they're taking it at the provincial and federal levels, but I think it's really important that we start taking a stand together and collectively um, and showing that we're not going to tolerate that at all. And I think uh, just a better working relationship between the three orders of government as well as an understanding of what each of our roles are. We've got a mandate as municipal electeds, so does the province and so does the federal government. And I think we need to do a better job of, of making sure that we're looking after the things that we need to and being a, being a partner with the other orders while they do the things that they need to as well. I don't want to leave it on a negative note here. I don't want to leave it on a note of uh, better relationships and we need to work. One last question to each one of you, but I'm going to go in reverse order from when I started. Uh, Councillor, what's on the future for yourself as a uh, director of cities up to 500,000 for Alberta municipalities? Are you going to be speaking to your municipal leaders across the province or uh, are you going to be, what, what, what's in store for yourself as director? Um, before I get there though, just, following on the last comment i think i have to i, I just think it needs to be said that 10 percent of this job is really hard usually because of the abuse we take 10 percent of this job is really boring usually because of the really long agenda package we're doing but 80 percent of this job is still phenomenal and awesome and we get to serve our communities every day work with great residents work with great colleagues and this still is a really awesome job and what that makes me excited for in my role as director and vice president of cities up to 500,000 is our summer road show is coming up where as those roads clear up, we're going to be having summer caucuses across the province. So our board will be hosting small kind of mini, mini one day conventions at all corners of the province. So every councillor, if they want, can get to them without driving to Calgary, Edmonton. And I know us as individual board members, we're really working hard on visiting individual councils across the province to share with them our work and hear what they're doing. And every time I go out I and meet with these councils, I'm so encouraged by the creativity that's happening out there, by the enthusiasm that they're approaching this job with. And I'm so excited to visit our members. And that's one of the, that's the best part of my role on Alberta municipalities is visiting municipal colleagues. Just like the best part of my role as a counselor is having an excuse to sit down for coffee with a lot more residents than I'd ever get to talk to in any other role. Mayor Jones, what about yourself as director of Towns East? What's on the what's in the store for the future for yourself? Uh, probably like Dylan, a lot of miles on my truck. <laughs> um, <laughs> and in the last couple of months, you know, I've, I've visited a few, uh, but of course, once the snow melts and I can actually hit a highway properly, and you know. Um, yeah, it's going to be some member visits. I get to go to Bon Accord next week. I was in Smoky Lake not that long ago. I've already been invited for golf and beverages in Beggarville. So, you know, it's uh, going to be hitting the road and hanging out with my elected peeps. Sounds like a fun summer, if you ask me. And what about yourself, President Gandum? I, I know you have 23 days left. What Outside of that, what what else are you going to be looking forward to over the next few months? Well, I need to find the dates for the Vagerville trip to go golfing. So that'll be first and foremost. Um, but like my colleagues, it's it's really exciting to be able to go meet with our members. Um, a few weeks ago, a few of us went up north to high level, and we got the opportunity to sit with some members of councils. Um, we got to go and volunteer at the Alberta Winter Games and Grand Prairie. All of the things I don't think that we'd have the opportunity to do if we weren't sitting on this board. And I think that our board members, all 15 of them, are tremendous community builders. And it doesn't matter if you're in a big city, uh, they're happy to go and visit with some of the summer villages or the villages and vice versa. Our summer villages are going in and meeting with and rubbing elbows with the mayors and councillors in our bigger centres as well. So I think it's really important that just because Trina's representing towns and Dylan's representing cities under 500,000, both of them are just as eager to go and meet any of the other sized communities across the province. So 
like those guys, I'll be putting a lot of miles on my truck going and visiting communities. And I get just a ton of energy from, from going and working with them. And sometimes you get to be a little bit of a problem solver too, or you get to be the one that, that learns from them and some of the best practices that they've been doing that I might not have thought of uh, over the last almost six years now of being on this board. I feel I'm a way better mayor in my community um, from what I've learned from other board members for sure. And then just the time I've spent networking with other mayors and councillors across the province. So I'm pretty fortunate that I know how lucky I am to be in the position I am uh, as president for sure. But even just being on the board has been invaluable. I love it. I can't say enough good things about it. Uh, so that's that's my summer coming up. Uh, lots of road trips, lots of visiting and the five MLCs that we're going to be doing this summer too. And we just get to go and check out new communities that I probably won't wouldn't have had the opportunity to or a reason to, and now I do. So we're we're looking forward to that. Well, hopefully, and I say this with respect to every municipality out there, that uh, those uh, the trucks that you're going to be driving to all these communities get their shocks checked out because we've talked about potholes a lot on this show and the need for infrastructure improvements. So hopefully those infrastructure improvements will come prior to your arrival. But if not, you'll be advocating for them afterwards. Um, thank you all for joining us today. Thank you so much for doing this. It's always a pleasure to sit down and talk about the issues that are facing Alberta municipalities. So thank you. Thanks, Chris. Thank Appreciate you. the time. I want to thank today's episode partner, Alberta Municipalities. For more information on the work that Alberta Municipalities is doing, visit abmunis.ca today. The link is in the show notes. Also, if today's episode sparked your interest, hit the subscribe button now. We're your go-to platform for comprehensive municipal coverage committed to keeping you well-informed as well as engaged. Until next time, stay informed, stay engaged, and most importantly, just keep talking.